Welcome Sojourners, this is Jonathan with Sojourners Awake. In my Dungeons and Dragons games, I call my players Sojourners. I chose this because of the word. I'll just read off the definition from the late 13th century. Uh, yeah, it's a really old word. To stay temporarily, reside for a time, to visit, to dwell, to spend the day with someone. Uh, the original Latin word, I hope I pronounce it right, diurnare, or diurnum, it just means day. It comes from the root word to shine. So again, you're getting the idea. To sojourn means to spend some time under the sun. <laughs> and that's the impression I wanted to give. You know, I believe that no matter who we are, each of us has 24 hours in the day. That's the resource we've been given. And what we do with that time it really just says what we value. In this interview with my friend Jin, we talk about the surprising effect that playing Dungeons and Dragons had on ourselves, our family, and really our growth as people. In the game, your character levels up, advances, gets magic, side, get, gets magic items, um, accomplishes quests, and that's all fun. But what was surprising is our own personal selves have also graduated. I've got a couple interviews uh, besides this one, but I want to put this one out there to see what kind of response I get. Again, playing D&D can be incredible for a pastime, having a good time with friends and family, but what surprises me is that how much it played into personal growth. And I like that. I like that gathering around the table much like gathering around the campfire back in the days of old and telling stories of tradition, tales of bravery, tales of our history. That's what Dungeons and Dragons feels, lot, feels like to me. We're just gathering around the table, looking at each other's faces, maybe around candlelight uh, or even around the light of our iPhones. <laughs> Either way, we're gathering around the table and sharing stories together. We're sojourning. We're spending a day. For spending a moment of light with each other. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Jen. We had a really good time and hopefully there's more after this. May your story continue. Roanoke was a character that Jen played in Out of the Abyss and I think we played for about nine months in the campaign. Yes. Yes. So uh, tell me just the basic about her, like her race, class, level, like what all that was like. Um, well, Roanoke was a, um, she's a, an Air Ganassi, or Genasi, or however it's pronounced, because yeah. like I said, no, this. <laughs> um, she was, um, started out as a rogue and then multi-classed into a fighter. And then my son came up with this amazing, like, opportunity to add in air guardian which was fantastic i mean cool. i told him i was like you've got to put this up on D, &D beyond because it's so good um and then so and we, i think we got to level i don't remember what level we ended up i want to say 14 13 was, 14 something yeah. like that but yeah i mean uh, mainly rogue like eight levels in rogue and then three levels in fighter and no or four no, nine levels in Rogue, three levels in Fighter, and one level in Air Guardian, or something like that. It was something like that. I think okay. it ended up yeah. close to that. Yeah. Um, well, actually, tell me, tell me about the Air Guardian because that's that's very unique. Oh my How gosh, it's really fantastic. My son Jackson is he plays with us, and he has this amazing ability to just research like nobody I've ever known. <laughs> so what you know what first inspired you to play Roanoke like what was the spark of creativity that generated her? I really love the idea of playing a rogue because I wanted to be sneaky. <laughs> I wanted mm -hmm. to be sneaky um and steal things because like I'm not that's not me <laughs> I'm not one girl like, <laughs> so not. we would so we would think <laughs> but if your sleight of hand is good, yeah if your sleight of hand is good no one ever knows right I, exactly like um it wasn't an easy thing it wasn't like I picked something oh I'll just I'm gonna be a fighter because all I have to do is like beat things up you know but but being a rogue like you really have to have this like thought process of of 
details that are going on around you, like seeing the things and how can you utilize them and how can you get around all the people and all the environment stuff to get what your ultimate goal is. Like it was a challenge. I was like, this is exciting to me. I didn't really play. I played her more on the good aspect, like a Robin Hood, but also for her benefit. Yeah. Um, not evil in nature. <laughs> Hey, Jonathan here with a quick break. We talked a little bit more about D&D, but then we talked about autism with Dungeons and Dragons. In this part of the interview, Jen talks a lot about the invitations that having autism in the home provides, as well as some of the challenges that need to be worked around. I hope you enjoy it. It was Israel. I mean, we have autism in my home and mm -hmm. communication is a significant like um, difficulty with all of us um like as a parent like learning how to effectively communicate with my son who struggles with it um his own communication with his peers or with us my husband is the same you know and then us wanting to like really kind of find that even ground of communication finding opportunities to practice ways to communicate is hard you're just kind of thrown into it and you just have to communicate so the idea of having a safe place in a safe type of environment to practice types of communication in an acting way like yeah. you really were kind of acting where you really were forced to different types of communication whether it be like in in um like campfire type situation where it's relaxed and you're just kind of like letting things flow or you're in combat and you like you have to like communicate effectively or things are not going to happen yeah and then um not even just communication between us communication with like npcs and the and the dungeon master and like how things are going it was like this multicolored blanket of communication which i thought was so very needed by us and so that was my idea of of going in was communication and then also practice of patience, like learning how not to talk over each other, learning how, when to be quiet and allow another person to kind of have their shining moment. Um, and then like also practicing social emotional skills. How can you control your emotions? When to control your emotions? Like there, these were all like practice scenarios that we took advantage of and that we can oh. take. And so, at first, like, I went into this, I was very closed off, and I really enjoyed Roanoke because she's a hoot, like, she's funny, but she was really closed off at first because I was closed off. I was not sure how to play my character. I hadn't played Dungeons and Dragons for 20 plus years, so it was a yeah. very, like, jumping off a cliff type moment, and, um, and she really came across as being a really bossy chick at first, <laughs> like, <laughs> like Roanoke and her band of misfits, you know, like that's yeah. how it really was when it was really just myself, Ooh. my husband and my son playing. And um. then in that, my goals changed. And so from the beginning, my goals were very different, like very specific oriented. And then my goals for her changed and it became more of a challenge to think beyond my personal and to really develop relationships um, as her with my other with the other players, and then learning how to be a real team instead of like just me the bossy chick telling people what we're doing or or just do it and then they don't have a choice, you know? It's yeah. just like yeah, oh my gosh! And then my husband was always like, oh my god, what are you doing? You know, like, like that. You know, I I did notice I did notice that early on in the campaign, Roanoke just would do something and you have to get in line. Yeah, like just follow me. <laughs> that was how it was at the beginning. Okay, well, that, that seems like, you know, and then we switched and the team got bigger and there's always, you know, when you add new players to an existing campaign, that's always going to create a brand new dynamic and you want to be careful with that. You want to make sure you make it as seamless as possible. Um, you know, what kind of, you know, you as a player, like, how did you have to adjust, you know, considering that Roanoke was calling the shots beforehand? And I definitely witnessed Roanoke, maybe not take a back seat, but maybe take more of a party seat. Yeah. 
So what, what was your, what was your thoughts behind that? And, and especially like how you used Roanoke to express that? Well, at first, like at the beginning, she, like I said, she was very closed off. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're part of my party. Like you're here to assist me in my mm -hmm. goals. But when we ended up expanding our, our team and we added two new players to the team, um, I really, I saw it as an opportunity. Okay. We have one more, one more um, team that was joining us. So we now yeah. we had two teams and we had their parents that was joining yeah. us as well. And I was like, I could already see in that moment, I was starting to really kind of visualize and really kind of acknowledge how my character was coming across and how, how she was playing. And I was like, this is not good. <laughs> this is not, it's not really that effective. Yeah. Um, it's not as enjoyable for everybody else. And so I took this as an opportunity to like, okay, I need to step back. My, my goal at that, that point changed in, in the team mindset and was like, I need to be more welcoming. I need to be more of a listener and really like take this as a backseat. Not so much that I, I just kind of like gave up or anything yeah. like that. It was more like, yeah. I need to really see this as not Roanoke's team of misfits and more like team of this, you know, we're mm. going to like yeah. conquer this place together. And I, and I think even when we, when Yandler came in for the first time, my, him, when he introduced himself, I think that was the real turning point. I actually like was welcoming to him and yeah. I said, Hey, I had this little bit of a conversation type thing, which I had never done with anybody in PCs wow. or anything. Yeah. And it was like, it was like a turning point for her and for me. Like I wanted her to be more. And in order for her to be more, I had to be more. Oh and my gosh. So, so awesome. it was a real, it was a real eye opener. And that is when I think the real change in maturity of my character really happened. Hey, Jonathan here for a second. I just wanted to point out that this is the yes and method that is often used in improv storytelling. It can be used in Dungeons and Dragons as well. The situation's going as planned, and then someone, whether it be the dungeon master, another player, introduce another idea. It's then the other player's responsibility to say yes and. It's not simply accepting the reality at face value, but asking if this new reality is true, what does it mean for me? It's about changing perspectives. We do it all the time in real life, and we can see it in real time during the game. And again, I just love how this works out in the game for real life. So. Yeah, I can totally see that. And that you didn't just, you didn't disappear yeah. in the background. You didn't become like, you, you allowed your character to yeah. evolve and morph and change. And really, I mean, that is, talk about communication studies and yeah. skills. I mean, that's life right there yeah it was. we do not we do not get to recreate our own little simulations over and over again there's always dynamics that are changing mostly everything's outside of our control and and now we have to adapt you know yeah. well i think if i had not <clears throat> in reality looking back and i see how how really tremendous that moment was if i had not done that or if i hadn't given that that <laughs> openness of my character to this new character coming in, I don't think that us as a team would have been as um, effective. And I don't think we would have made the true partnership that I think we have today. Even to the yeah. point of like them joining us again for this new campaign that we just Exactly, started. yeah. And that's, that's such a good point because I think sometimes, you know, you hear the old adage, oh, this is what my character would do. <clears throat> and it's like, well, you are the one in yeah. charge of your character that is the one thing you get to control in dungeons and dragons yeah so why would you make a character that does not meld well that does not evolve and does not change that's a fixed mindset correct so i mean yeah good job at like 
you know, and demonstrating how someone can become a round character. They can evolve and change and morph and adapt over time based on what the situation calls for. Yeah. So that's cool. That's really good. So, uh, you know, with Roanoke, I think you kind of talked about this, but I do like to hear the beginning, the middle, and the end to show that, I mean, the characters are, the sojourners, the characters are really like the focal point of each story. Yeah. And so that's the exciting piece. And I hope, um, you know, I, as, when I say, when I see players do their homework and really work hard on the characters, I think that makes a great story in the dungeon master you know i just almost set up the playground and watch the kids play yeah. and interact with each other that brings my heart warmth is when i see characters interacting with each other yeah. which is you know my weekly challenge is uh my weekly challenge this week is for you know do your homework and have your character ask one question to another character for the next session yeah maybe it's something like hey where'd you learn that feature how do you do your magic why do you pray to your god because that's character to character interaction, which is always more real than NPC to character interaction, <laughs> right? So very angry about her family. And then she was vocal about that um, and her past. And she was very closed off about even sharing a lot of that. Like her teammates just knew kind of more present. Um, and they really didn't understand what she had left behind. She kept it really closed in. But at that point, she really started to share a little bit. And she was starting to see past some of those really poor choices she had made up until this point. And after losing a party member, we lost a party member, yeah. um, a few cracks started to show in the shell that she had, this defensive shell that she had kind of built up. And um, even though she really didn't like the character, like personally, it was mm -hmm. the fact that, that things had led up to this character dying and yeah. she had played a part in it. And it was very like painful to mm -hmm. acknowledge that. And so, and they had not had that much time together to really form a bond. But the yeah. fact that this character who she felt a responsibility to had died as a result of like them not uh, not working well together it was a really it was a painful moment and so i felt like that was the turning point and then these new people coming in and saying okay i'm going to be a better person i'm going to be a better team player i am really going to take responsibility for what i'm doing and that was that was her turning point her middle yeah i think you know, the, the important thing about D&D &D is for the characters, as well as the dungeon master, to take anything that happens and make it significant. Mm -hmm. You know, any any moment can be a pivotal moment for a character, whether you choose it or not. So, yeah. it, you know, from a, a player a player character dying to the discovery of, you know, I mean, or the discovery of your grandfather, you know, yeah. that was, you know, we introduced... Roanoke's grandfather as a way to tether her back to her past. Hey, Jonathan here. So at this point, we talk a little bit about the game. Not sure if you're familiar with Out of the Abyss, but it's a game adventure module for Dungeons and Dragons. And in this story, the character Roanoke, who ended up uh, making a pact with Frozer Blue, one of the demon lords, and then broke the pact, caused a fracture in the universal contracts and her grandfather Samir kind of showed up out of the woodwork to take on this responsibility for her and this provided a ton of character development for Jen's character Roanoke okay back to the show yes and how, how do you think that went because we you know had Samir with the party for a while as Roanoke's grandfather and then he you know as the the, the bigger man so to speak took on her pact with Frozer Blue, or the Demi, yeah, Frozer Blue, and um, and took that burden from her for a while. Um, I think that was part of the healing process. I think that was like a moment of like 
oh my gosh, this, I'm confronting this past of which I feel like when she left, she was very young. And then mm. she's now an adult, many years have passed. And she's being confronted with like, not just her past, but her family. Like a, like a true head of her family. Yeah. And like learning to connect again in a positive way and acknowledging what she had done had been painful, not just to her, but to others. And then her grandfather actually like taking on this contract that ultimately she would have had to take on. Yeah. And then it would have separated her, I think, from the party. It would have caused, like, probably her nature to change completely. Yeah. Um, for him to take that on was, like, the breaking point of, like, I, I, I want to be better. I want to be what I was meant to be. And I want to really take on my heritage and really be the ergonomy that my grandfather sees me to be. That's, and it was really, great. it was like, because of that, that connection that the, like you bring him in as an NPC and like allowing her to really do that. And then also as a, re, uh, as a kind of like ripples in, in a pool, like this drop, he's in there. And then the waves that kind of came out, like it affected her ability to really interact with her teammates and really interact in a positive way so that she was doing things that were going to benefit the party instead of just her. Yeah, because I can imagine she would either have to have left the party completely yeah. or turned so dark that she could no longer be functioning or would just have to be uh, some kind of death. It would, well, it there would were some pretty... hints. There were some hints that that was going to potentially happen because she had had some madness leading up into that and then lost yeah. it and then madness coming in that you could see how it, it, it wasn't bad, but it was enough that it was like, you could see how it was going to become worse. Yeah. And so, yeah, I get, yeah, it was pretty intense. <laughs> when I think you For did me, a good job. Yeah, yeah, well, I was scared, believe me. <laughs> I was scared to put all that on you, but I think you did a good job using Samir and taking him up on this offer and then not squandering it. Yeah. Because I think that, for me, that was the turning point in Roanoke. Yeah. That was the turning point when she realized she had just escaped this horrible contract and that her actions had affected even to the far realms of the universe. Yeah. You know, everyone knew about this this wish spell that she had cast and then broke. So, yes. you know, consequences, consequences, consequences. Yeah. But I think you did a good job reconciling her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what else would you like to add about her and you know maybe why was it important to tell her story um and anything else you'd like to add about roanoke's character um roanoke she didn't she didn't die in the end which was great <laughs> yeah. we were all worried about that for a minute yeah <clears throat> um but she had value like i do and i see that like yeah. She ha she she was valued by her party members. She was valued in a way that I think um, grew over time, and because of that, it it really impacted me because I was able to see that I have value um, mm. as well. Like even though I was playing this other and it was a game and everything, I was able to oh, appreciate that I had I I have value. Like I I. Um, accomplish something great with her and I allow in that my other members in our party or our other players were able to accomplish things for themselves too like I assisted in helping them and so that was a very valuable moment to me absolutely um yeah. she really held um more of my pro my personality than I thought she did but she really did <laughs> um <laughs> probably more so than any other characters I've played so far um, yeah. and uh, she was she was pretty serious um, to a great degree and she was really sad in her life and yeah. um, but she allowed me to pretend and to really use my imagination and as a grown-up or as an adult <laughs> that's really hard 
Like it we is, don't really have is. those opportunities to do that unless you're working in a very creative industry. Like you're writing or you're creating music or you're you're doing things that are a constant draw on that imagination. And I don't like I work for a CPA. <laughs> like, yeah, really, exactly. You know? Yeah. And so I loved being able to really use those amazing skills that I had as a kid and continue to develop them and grow them like as an adult and appreciation as an adult. Um, Roanoke was really an avatar for my feelings during this mm. time period. Oh, that is so well said. Um, she was a way for me to practice life outside of myself. And I love that I can do this over and over again, like through different things and through different characters and through different personalities. Like it's like a practice upon a practice upon a practice. And Roanoke really helped me. Um, and she deserves a lot of recognition because without her, I don't think that I would be where I am right now. Like, I feel like I accomplished a lot in those nine months that we played her. So. That is amazing to hear. And it, it fully supports what I believe that every single one of us are creative beings. We are creating beings, we are spiritual, and we do not use those skills often enough. And I think through this endeavor, we can, you know, it's clear that you can exercise and, and play pretend and, and do life better by practicing this creativity. Yeah. And it's, I'm, I'm so glad to hear that it's a, it's available to anybody. It's a low barrier of entry. It's something that you don't have to be necessarily good at because I think intuitively you are playing who you are. And it's like you said, it's giving you a safe place to practice your emotions and kind of lay them out on the table. It can be incredibly therapeutic. And there's been so many times where I've left a session thinking, oh, I feel cleansed. I feel like I got something off my chest. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there were um, times when we left and I was very emotionally charged. And I'd be texting, I'm not really happy with how that ended. There were so many times. I'd be like, yeah. I don't like this. This is not happening. And then we would come back and it would like resolve itself. <laughs> it's, it can be a roller coaster, but I, I yeah. do want to commend you for going through it because, you know, I've gotten some feedback about my, my stories and games that you know, there is a lot of role play. It's not yeah. just hack and slash. And I try to like, when I have a new player, just let them know like, hey, I, I do present a lot of uh, dr drama and yeah. maybe even emotionally charged situations. Um, we're always gonna talk about them and make sure everybody's on board. Um, but I, you know, I like family dynamics. I like communication. I think it's a great way to practice communication. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and, you know and, and I love, you know, like you're a CPA or you, you know, you're a, you work for a CPA and you bring a certain skill set to the table that I don't have. But when you bring that to the table, that challenges me to up my game with my NPCs to make them more challenging and more realistic for you. Oh, my notes, so, my notes. I yes. Honest. <laughs> you do. Yes. You are the note taker. <laughs> I have a journal of like, I don't know, like the sick, like of all the things. And I, I think that is a skill that I brought in that, that I have, you know, I can struggle with some memory issues and I'll just like play through it, but everybody's like, that's not really gonna happen. <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah. so to keep me honest, like I feel like it's a, it's a skill and not anybody else in our party really does that. Like it's not every party has a person who does that either. And so they really depend on you to really kind of remember everything. And that's hard. <laughs> I can't imagine yeah. how hard your job is at that point. Um, but yeah, I no, know it's, it's kind of, it's kind of funny. And I, but, but I will say this, that, that in playing her and then having this opportunity to play with you, like we appreciate the amount of work that goes into our games and awesome. it goes into the world that you have kind of built and allowed us to help you build. We appreciate the amount of time and effort and knowledge and research and planning because like you said before you'll plan 100 scenarios and we may be doing five you know <laughs> so or we may like skip through a whole bunch of stuff and you're like yeah. oh well that's okay but you really you really set us up for success in that's in awesome. our in our game and that really does make the adventure so much more rewarding for us as as a group 
for sure. That is exciting to hear. That is so good. Well, I had fun with this. I okay. I love doing interviews and and it's I, I I'm just blown away constantly that we can take some you know, it's a linguistic game. We're just talking uh -huh. around a table, right? We're scribing yeah. things down on there's no there's, we're creating the entertainment. Yes. And that it can be so productive is really heartwarming to me so yes um i sincerely appreciate everything you've given to the game as well and how seriously you take it and how much fun you have so we can't wait we're excited we've already right. really enjoyed our new campaign it's gonna be fantastic well i'm excited to learn about your new character uh nahala yes nahala. and um i'm also interested to see her uh relationship with um lucky the dwarf <laughs> yes <laughs> Because I think he will, um, I think he's going to show up quite a bit. She's a uh, comic. She's a funny yeah. goofy kind of, like, totally, like I did with with Roanoke. She's kind of in a different realm. Mm -hmm. I modeled her off of totally different types of people. And so I'm hoping to really, like, be a little less serious and a little more fun and a little more, like, Indiana Jones, Han yeah. Solo, you know, it's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting. I think, yeah, I think so far you've done a good job. And I've had to do a couple double takes and be like, wait, who is this now? This is not the same character. Like, you're you're, you're giving off a totally different energy in the new it's campaign. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah. Like, I'm it's, excited. So It's ridiculous. So I, I have to admit, I resisted it at first. And then I realized, no, this is going to be slapstick. This is going to be great. <laughs> it's a sandwich. Um, the sandwich. Is. I stole a yeah. sandwich. It's a sandwich. All right. <laughs> well, hey, uh, our story continues. Thank you, Jen, for joining no me problem. today. Thank and, uh, you hope this for helps this out everyone in crafting your characters. Yeah. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you to Tabletop Audio for their wonderful selection of ambiance. If you haven't had a chance, go to www.tabletopaudio.com and put some of your hard-earned money into their projects. And so, our story continues.